Welcome everyone. <laughs> I'm Steve Farrell, the Worldwide Executive Director for Humanities Team, and I'm super excited to be here with you for this free program. It's called The Key to Personal Empowerment and the Future of Human Civilization. Bruce H. Lipton, PhD, is an internationally recognized leader in bridging science and spirit. Stem cell biologist, best-selling author of The Biology of Belief, and recipient of the 2009 Goy Peace Award, he has been a guest speaker on hundreds of TV and radio shows, as well as keynote presenter for national and international conferences. Welcome to the program, Bruce. Great to be here with you. Steve, I am so excited to be here with you, but more importantly, with our wonderful audience out there, especially at this time of uh, chaos in the world, uh, there's a little order and sanity that can be seen here, and I hope we provide it. <laughs> Absolutely. We, uh, that's right. Uh, there's, there is a lot of uh, challenge out there and uh, we're going to, we're going to definitely provide some sanity here uh, and some vision around new possibilities. Now let's jump right in with Bruce and get to the important topics that we've planned for the hour. And Bruce, as we get started, can you share how the role of consciousness, according to the principles of quantum physics, plays a role in shaping life experiences? Well, the first thing we have to understand, and this is the most important valid truth before we say the next thing, and that is quantum physics is the most truthful, accurate of all the sciences on planet Earth. There's no science that comes near uh, the um, truth that is provided by quantum physics. And I say, well, understanding that, then we start with the first premise of quantum physics. And the first premise is consciousness is creating our life experience. Now, from a world of physics, it's like, what the heck does that mean? It's like the pictures in our mind are broadcast into the world, into the, into the universe that we live in, and that our consciousness is shaping that reality in front of us. Now, of course, there's collective consciousness, which then shapes our general collective reality, but then we all else also have our own personal consciousness that's affecting this. And then you go, wow. Well, physics, you know, uh, how does that connect to biology? Uh, and the answer is very important right here because it turns out that the brain uh, is translating the pictures in our mind. That's what the function of the brain is. See the pictures in your mind and then manifest a reality that uh, accommodates that, that idea. Uh, that's why we live in a world that seems, yeah, I knew that was going to happen, or yeah, this is what I expected and all that, is because it's not a chance we are manifesting in front. So I say, well, that was really cool, and, but the interesting part for me was, as a biologist, the connection uh, shows how the consciousness of the brain is translated into chemistry that goes through the body uh, via the blood, so that the blood is not just providing nutrition, the blood provides information to the cells. So it's like uh, hormones, neurotransmitters, emotional chemicals, whatever. Uh, this is information that the body's experiencing. And I say, so what's the relevance? I say, the chemistry of the brain is a complement to the picture in the mind. <laughs> if you have a positive picture, you create positive chemistry. And if you have a negative picture, unfortunately, you create negative chemistry. The chemistry is a complement to the picture. I say, why is that relevant? Because the chemistry goes through the blood, and that chemistry uh, is used to adjust the uh, genetics and the behavior of our cells. And I go, oh my goodness, then the picture in the mind ultimately is the information translated by cells into genetics and behavior. And I go, absolutely. And then we start to understand them. Oh my goodness. And the consciousness, which is generating those pictures, is the primary element responsible for the character of our lives. Uh, and it's really hard for people to get a lot of this, especially the quantum physics part, because uh, one of the most important facts of quantum physics that makes it quantum physics is that when uh, we saw the world through the eyes of Newtonian mechanics, classical figure, physics, uh, we saw a world split into two realms, energy and matter, and that we're told that those two realms don't really interact with each other. Uh, so we've separated matter and energy, which separates body and science from consciousness, which is energy. So uh, for, for years and years and years, science ignored the role of mind uh, in, in biology. 
but inevitably had to face it when we started to understand about the nature of the placebo effect. And the placebo effect is very important to our question about consciousness and world right here, because basically what is the placebo effect, which is responsible for over a third or maybe up to two thirds of all medical healing is placebo effect. I said, what is it? I go, well, uh, uh, you have an illness, a, a doctor comes up and says, look, I got this newest pill greatest thing the pharmaceutical company has ever made. It's colored purple, so that's really you know, really good. Uh, and I say, why is it relevant? I say, because this pill is gonna heal you. And you take this pill with, oh my goodness, I mean, I've got this new drug, and then you get well, and then you find out the pill was a sugar pill. And he goes, well, the, the whole important story here is wh what does that mean? <laughs> and it means simply this, what healed you was not the pill. What healed you was the positive belief about the pill. And I said, so, so belief healed you, not, not the pill. And everybody goes, yeah, yeah, okay, I understand placebo effect. And I go, now what we need to add to this is, which is not talked about, and it's more important at this time, is placebo is a result of positive thinking. W what is the consequence of negative thinking? I go, oh my God, it's equally powerful in shaping your life as is the positive thinking. And in medicine, uh, negative thinking consequences are referred to as the nocebo effect. I go, what does that mean? I said, negative thinking can cause any disease in your body to manifest and can even kill you. Just the thought you're going to die with belief behind it, that will kill you. So the power is this. It's not whether it's positive belief or negative belief. The point is simply this. It's belief, which is consciousness, which ends up shaping the character of your life. And now biology and physics are saying the exact same story. So it really says, oh my goodness, this is a time to recognize your thoughts are not just passing through your head. Your thoughts are manifesting a, a life experience. And all of a sudden it says, then we should pretty much be concerned about what we're thinking these days. Yeah, boy, and isn't that so important? Yeah, thank you, Bruce. So much was so much important wisdom right now there. There, thank you, thank you very much. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just come right at this next question. So, Bruce, how can we take control of our genetics, our health, our life experiences by exerting influence over the signals sent to our mind by our consciousness, beliefs, and emotions? Well, the first thing we have to understand is what signals am I putting in my mind? Because remember, the mind is translated by the brain, which then creates a manifestation of the picture in our mind, health or disease, whatever the picture is, the mind's going to create it. I say, well, what are the signals I'm sending to the mind? So we have to step back for a second and just say, look, the brain is the interface between this consciousness and this body. And I go, the brain is a computer and everyone's always said it. And I go, it is a computer. It's a, the best computer in the, uh, in the world. It may be, you know, at this point, a universe, who knows? And I say, so why is it relevant? And I say, the brain is a computer. And I say, so what? And I go, if you go to the store and buy a brand new computer, you take it home, it's got an operating system. I say, yeah, you can push start. I say, so you start it up and then you got the screen turns on. And I say, now do something. And you go like, well, well, write, draw, do a spreadsheet, do something. I go, I can't. I say, why not? I didn't put any programs <laughs> into the machine. So I have to download programs like a MS Word or something like that. And I download these programs. And now I can use these programs to run my computer. So here's the point. Uh, when a child is uh, in the last trimester of pregnancy, just uh, last three months before birth, the operating system of the brain is turned on. Now the brain is in operation. But the question is, now you have to get programs. I go, well, how do you get programs put into the system? And the answer is this. What we observe in the world is downloaded as programs into the subconscious. If you observe wonderful, happy, loving things, so that those programs are downloaded. And if you observe strife, anger, and all that other kind of stuff, well, those programs are downloaded. And I go, so what? And I go, the first seven years of a child's life, the brain is not predominantly in consciousness at all. First seven years of a child's life, the brain is predominantly in a lower vibration. Uh, and that's when you measure brain's vibration, putting wires on a person's head called EEG electroencephalograph, I can read your brain function, there are different vibrations. 
the lowest vibration is delta sleep. The, the next one, theta, which is characterized as imagination. Then next one higher is alpha, which is calm consciousness. And then the higher vibration in alpha is beta, which is like schoolroom thinking consciousness, okay? So I go, so what? And I say, when a child's born, and for the first seven years, the predominant EEG, electrical activity of a child's brain, is not even in consciousness. It's a lower vibration called theta, which I said was imagination. And this is how uh, kids can live in an imaginary world of drinking, uh, you know, tea party, pour nothing into the cup, and drink it and go, well, that was the best tea I ever had in my life. Uh, and of course, that low calorie cake is on that plate, and you could eat this invisible mud cake if you want. And it was like, that was the best cake you ever had. I go, this is theta operating, mixing real world and imagination. But theta is hypnosis. I go, so what's the relevance? I say, the computer of the brain operating system, three months before birth. From three months before birth to age seven, the operating system is operating at a lower vibration, theta, below, below consciousness, which is hypnosis. I go, why is it relevant? I say, how do you think you got programs to manage your life? I say, you didn't read a book and take, uh, you know, you didn't download any software. Uh, what you did was observe. You observed your mother, your father, your family and community, and your observations were downloaded as behavior. You saw how they behaved, you recorded it, and that becomes a fundamental character of your behavior because that's the foundational program in your, your computer brain. And I say, after age seven, you get to operate the computer. But here's the point. Uh, most of these programs, since they're embedded, you, they're just automatic. How you relate to your family, how you relate to the community, you, you learn that by observing other people. So your behavior isn't coming from you, it's a download from those around you. And I go, so what's the relevance? I say, then your life from those programs is not controlled by you, it was controlled by what you observed. Uh, if your mother and father didn't have a great relationship, guess what? You're already off on the wrong trail because your program is bad relationship programming. And I go, so the point is this. You say, well, after age seven, I could be conscious, which is creative. I said, absolutely, you can. Uh, and so the monkey wrench now, big monkey wrench of the whole game is this. Consciousness is creative. I can think of the most wonderful world in the world, but I could also... Uh, you know, be uh, operating my life with this consciousness. But here's the point. When you think, consciousness is not looking out. Consciousness is looking in. A thought is on the inside. So if I say, what are you doing on Sunday at 2 o'clock? If you're going to answer that question, it's not in front of you. I say, where are you going to get the answer from? You're going to go, I'm thinking. I go, oh, consciousness, when it's thinking, is looking in. It's not looking out. I go, well, what if you're driving the car and you're thinking? I said, oh, you're not watching the road. And I go, well, <laughs> we do it all the time. I go, yeah, because here's the cr critical point. Subconscious is autopilot. When conscious is thinking, subconscious takes over the driving, but it will drive according to the program that it got. I go, so why is it relevant? And here's the conclusion. Only 5% of the day is conscious creativity controlling our wishes and our desires and what we want from life. Because 95% of the day, that's the amount of time consciousness is spent thinking, which then means 95% of the day, your life is not run by your wishes and desires, it's run by your programs, uh, the majority of which are disempowering and limiting and self-sabotaging. So the important understanding here is very critical is that we, we are operating a computer, and if you've been programmed, uh, and I'm going to say that 95% of your life is coming from that program, and most of that's negative, and then you go, last thing you would say, well, I wouldn't do a stupid program to sabotage myself. I go, you do not see the program when you are thinking. Uh, so let me close with this story that I've told for 30-some years in lectures, same one, because there's not a better one yet, <laughs> and that is simply this. I say you have a friend. You know your friend's behavior very, very well, and you know your friend's parent. And one day you see your friend has the exact same behavior as their parent, uh, and you want to tell your friends. So you go, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. And I said, back away from Bill. The moment you say that, Bill's going to say, how can you compare me to my dad? I'm nothing like my dad. And I go, this is the most profound story in the world. Most people have experienced I said, what, what does it represent? I said, 
everyone else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. Only Bill does not see it and will say, I'm nothing like my dad. And everyone knows the behavior is exactly like his dad. And they laugh and I go, but here's the problem. Why, why didn't Bill see it? I said, because 95% of the day, Bill is thinking and playing the program. And while playing the program, not observing what's going on because he's observing what's going in. Uh, and as a result, doesn't see the behavior. And then the last concluding remark, Steve, before I <laughs> jump off of this is, we are all Bill, <laughs> that's the problem. We are all doing the same thing. And, and that's why if our life isn't working out, we, we always think it's the outside is where the problem comes from, but not have owned. 95% of the day you're playing behaviors that are probably sabotaging you and like Bill, you don't see them. And all you see is the result. And then it looks like you're a victim because you didn't see that you were creating 95% of your life, not from your wishes and desires conscious, but from your programs in the subconscious. Wow, time to move from those uh, unconscious programs to conscious programs, huh, Bruce? <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely, right. because it makes a difference, and I can swear to it, because I never believed in it myself, but hey, for the last 20 plus years, <laughs> heaven on earth, and it's not a coincidence. Oh, man, I see it. Phase two. Repeat, take the single entity, make a community out of it, and then create something new. And in our case, where are we? We've already created a smartest human that was thousands and thousands of years ago. But since then, we have come together in community to do what? Create the ultimate community, our destination, a new organism called humanity, where we ourselves, each one of us, in the body of the same organism, so every human on earth is a cell in the same body. And if we start to treat each other as, hey, we're all in this together as a giant community to create this new organism, that is our evolutionary destination to create a whole new intelligence on planet earth called a humanity. Oh, humanity's team. There they are. Okay. 